So uh, yeah, hi, I'm Casey. I'm a senior developer at King's Distributed Systems in Kingston, Ontario. And thank you everyone for coming and listening to this. Um, you know, the rewarding thing about programming, what excites me about it is that moment when you put a lot of work and dedicated your heart to this little nucleus of code, trying to capture in abstraction something out there in the real world and it amazes you, that, that little nucleus, that it can solve problems you never thought of before. When you're building that program, you ask yourself, did I get the abstraction right? And sometimes the only way to answer that is to see your tool applied to a new problem in the same domain. And if it's basically already able to solve that problem, then you know, you did it right. Today, I wanna to tell you the story about how I experienced that with my first crystal project, getting a PhD in crystallography. So the story starts in the beautiful city of Prague. Um, that's where I was a student at Charles University and a researcher at the Institute of Physics. And what we were studying is this field in material science called crystallography, which is all about the symmetric arrangement of atoms in a material. And we study the symmetry, which means that the atoms can be, like if there's a mirror plane symmetry, then we'd say the arrangement of atoms on one side of the mirror plane should be the same as on the other side, just the mirror image. Um, or if you have a rotation axis, then you'd say that they should be related to each other by some kind of rotation around an axis. And the surprising thing perhaps is that by just understanding a few basic symmetry rules, a lot of times we can predict the material properties that we can expect. So I, I'd like to show you the problem we are working on in the form of a table. And what we have here in these columns, G and F, is these things called point groups. And one of the surprising things in crystallography is how often something that seems so infinite and vast can be summarized by just a, a small set of countable things. And that's the case here. There's just 32 of these point groups. And what a point group is, uh, here's one, two over M, is it's just a group of these operations, like I mentioned. So like two here means a rotation axis, and M means that mirror plane that I mentioned. So, so we have a group of these. And here in this table, we're looking at these group subgroup combinations. And so if you, if you work through all those combinations, you end up with 212 of them, and we call them species. So, so that's the rows of the table. And the columns are these vector-like quantities. And these correspond to physical properties, like whether the material can have a macroscopic electric dipole moment. So for each of these transitions in these rows from, from a group to a subgroup, and for each of these vector-like quantities, then we're gonna study whether it's a full transition or a partial transition or not a transition. And we can mark that with these circles here. So fully colored means it's a full transition, partially colored and so on. Um, and these question marks show you sort of where I showed up in 2017 as a new uh, PhD student. I was assigned to learn some physics, learn some symmetry, and see if I couldn't answer this question uh, going through row by row, item by item, by hand, because that's how we did this. The, the previous results that were published here, that was all done uh, by hand. And being a programmer, I didn't take me very long to start thinking about ways I could do this in object-oriented way. My background was, was Ruby, um, like many other speakers today. And so I um, can share with you a little bit of this structure, the structure approach that I took. And um, I started to think about this problem in two in a couple of different libraries. So first I wanted to kind of start far away from my problem, this question of species and vector-like quantities and just capture the math. So the SIM-based module has a very general notion of these operations, which the technical term is isometry. And this idea they can be grouped together in, in a mathematical group. And that's about it. And, and then this other library, SIM32, then it would know more about this idea of, I have certain types of isometries like an inversion or a rotation or a reflection. And it would group those together. These are all called point isometries. So group them into a point group. Um, and then still this, these two layers are separated from the actual questions that I was trying to solve, the uh, question about species. 
and so on. And I took this as an excuse to learn Crystal. I'd heard of it before, and I was really pleased to learn some of the language structures that were available. So for example, this isometry idea, I decided to take a, an interface style approach. So um, it's a module, the isometry module, and has some concrete and some abstract methods. And then when I want to create the actual uh, isometry itself, like a rotation, then it's just a class and I include that module. And then the type system, I'm, I'm able to say, hey, this is an array of isometries and they can all be totally different classes, uh, but it knows just what to do with that. It's really nice. And of course, uh, Crystal also supports uh, classic class-based inheritance patterns. So my point group could just be a subclass of a symmetry group. So, so using these libraries, I was able to write this little application layer whose job was to output the LaTeX for this table that I was showing you. So, so here it is, there, here's the final result after, you know, after a couple of months of learning some physics and, and writing some crystal, I was able to produce this table and I'm sure there's more here than you can really absorb or maybe see very clearly on a video call like this. But the, the, the thing I can show here is that that little application was able to derive all 212 species just because these libraries understood groups and point groups so well. And it could figure out the names of, of them. So this naming and stuff, that's not hard coded anywhere. It's able to understand what the names of these should be. And, uh, and of course, it answered the question, as you can see. These uh, little black uh, circles filled and half filled are, we, we checked them against all of our hand derived answers and they were right. So it would seem the job was done. Um, we were quite happy with that. But uh, then came that test that I mentioned, which is that um, we wonder if our program that we've made is really, really able to adapt to the new problem. And in our case, the new problem, which I'd never heard of before, but of course, you know, other researchers in my field had, is these 122 magnetic point groups. And, and what happens here is we have the same operations as those 32 point groups I mentioned, and, and now we add one. And it's this, it's this simple operation that doesn't move anything around, but it allows us to flip a magnetic dipole. So if on one side of the mirror plane is pointing up, then I can determine with this on the other side if it should be pointing up or down, and then they've got this symmetry relationship. So I'm just adding the one. And, and when I learned this, I, I thought, well, how hard can this be? I'm only adding one thing. My software can handle that. Well, my advisor's answer was it can be quite hard. Uh, the 32 groups have become 122 magnetic point groups. And we only know how many species there are, how many rows this table has, because one professor worked painstakingly through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases by hand and tabulated them. And he determined that there were 1,601 of these species. And if you consider also that the four columns we were studying are now eight vector-like quantities, then you have more than 12,000 different cases to check. And when we were starting this project, the number of those that we knew the answer to was zero. So it, it's quite a big new problem space. And there's a lot of nuance and detail there that, that is easy to, to miss. So I, I went home um, that week, uh, duly humbled, and thought about what, you know, read about this and tried to see what I could do. And the only thing that I could still think to do was create a new library, Sim Magnetic, add this one isometry, have it inherit from the other guys that have already implemented this, and uh, give it a new place to live, the subclass uh, magnetic point group. That was it, just these three files, none of them over 100 lines of code. And, and then I fired up my same application layer that I had written before and to see what kind of table would get out. And I got this. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that this is way too small and dense to ever get across a video call, and that's fine. Um, but I, I can promise you that there are more than 12,000 of those little black dots, like I mentioned. And as many as we could stomach checking were correct. Um, they, they had all the right group subgroup relationships and figured out all the names um, with a little extra tweaking. And it even actually found a previously missed species. You can't see it, but this table has 1,602 rows in it. So, so here, here it is, this huge world of exploration and data I would never have guessed existed, uh, that I never knew um, 
was out there and I never would have tried to solve. When I was first writing those two little libraries, I, I couldn't have guessed that not only was this within my grasp, it was within easy reach. It was low hanging fruit, really. I didn't know that. My advisor didn't know that. And I'm pretty confident no one else in the community knew it either, or they probably would have done it first. So that's the power of not giving in to the temptation sometimes to do the low level manual repetitive work just because it's more accessible because that work doesn't really scale up and it can give us a false sense of the challenge of the problem. What we thought might take a year or more turned out to be just a week's work. We wondered about the investment of writing software for just 212 species, right? Originally, because you can do that by hand in a couple of days. But little did we know that the effort of writing software for just those first few hundred cases made the effort of writing software for tens of thousands of cases trivial. So that's the punchline. Uh, that's the take home message. It's worth your time. It's worth your time to invest in the abstraction and get it right. Thank you.